All right. Um, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Matt Barris. Uh, he's the Director of Maintenance Operations for Greenbelt Homes Incorporated. He's responsible for developing and implementing GHI stormwater management program and supporting efforts to promo promote sustainability throughout the co-op. He has led efforts to encourage rain barrel usage in Greenbelt and designed and implemented numerous bioretention rain gardens in the community. Prior to joining GHI, Matt led watershed education and restoration programs for the Potomac Conservancy, a regional nonprofit dedicated to protecting the Potomac River watershed. So Matt's going to talk about GHI's rain barrel program and storm management activities. This presentation, some of the content I have here has already been covered, so I'll probably move through a few of these slides a little quicker. And I'll try to uh, touch specifically on some aspects that are requirements for GHI. We are a 16-member housing cooperative here in Greenbelt on about 250 acres of land. The community was built in the 1930s and 40s as a Roosevelt New Deal project. In many ways, Greenbelt was the archetype for the green communities that people are now constructing and endeavoring to construct now. It is designed around a walkable community, very pedestrian friendly, clustered uh, home development, and a lot of green open space. So it's really the model for that is people are all excited about now in new development. But being a very old community, it also has a lot of very old stormwater challenges. And so over the last few years, we've been trying to work to implement some stormwater management practices here in Greenbelt to deal with some of those challenges. Uh, I'll also in this presentation talk a little more generally about uh, rain barrels and other uh, rain uh, harvesting practices that could be applicable to other folks. Again, uh, this is uh, what we're going to do, talking about rain barrels, why they're important, the mechanics of ordering one if you're a GHI member, as well as how to install and maintain them. And like anything, getting them put in is the, only, is the beginning of the adventure. You have to make sure that you're able to uh, maintain these practices for their continued use and effectiveness. We've already talked on this briefly, but uh, I'll touch on it just to reiterate. The um, watershed is the area of land that uh, anything that falls on that land in a form of precipitation drains to the lowest point. So if you take your hands, put them together like a cup, that's a watershed. Anything that would fall in your hands is going to end up in your pinky fingers, which is going to end up going down to a uh, stream and ultimately into the Chesapeake Bay. We've seen this slide already, but I want to iterate one or couple, one or two points that we've glossed over. The um, impervious surfaces, rooftops, sidewalks, driveways, roads, even our grass, as Louisa said, is 16 times more, uh, produces 16 times more stormwater runoff than a forest or a natural landscape. So think about that. One gallon of water that falls in the forest you're going to have 16 gallons worth of that type of runoff, that 16 times that percentage um, that runs and falls on your rooftop ending up in the stream. The reason that happens here is in the forest, it, yes, you have vegetation in your lawn. There's grass in your lawn. But in the forest, it's thick layers of compost, you know, leaf litter, uh, very uncompacted soils that that water just quickly percolates down through. In our lawns, even the best installed lawn, the best rototilled garden is going to be compacted to a certain degree more than you would have in a, in a natural landscape. The, uh, if you've had your home as a newer construction and it was built when they uh, brought backhoes and other equipment up around to dig your foundation, that itself has probably compacted the soil around your building. 50% of that compaction <laughs> happened during the time when your home was constructed. Why is that important? We talked a little bit about the pollution, but this is a, an interesting set of percentages to pay attention to here. In a natural stream corridor, like on the left here, you have about 5% impervious coverage, you know, just a little bit of, of hardened surfaces. As those percentages increase, you see the damage to the stream channel itself. So consider this was Indian Creek or Beaver Dam Creek or any of the small streams that flow through your neighborhood. Even a small increase in impervious surfaces, up to 8 to 10 percent of the watershed, you start to see down cutting of that stream channel. Once you get to 20 percent, the photo is not a very good one here, but that storm, that pipe coming out of the ground there, 
the soil from that stream bank has eroded back six feet already. This bank is eight feet deep. That normal stream channel, that would be a few inches to a foot, gradual slope. It's a steep embankment. As your impervious surface increases, you start to see uh, erosion of the banks that, such that trees are falling into, their, into those banks now. And then you get down to our urban landscapes. We've given up on trying to maintain a stream corridor. We've put concrete in that stream. That concrete was put in there because it was an engineered solution to keep that sediment from washing out and from that land from eroding out. This is a sign of failure right here of our, of our urban streams. And what that means as far as stream quality is the impervious surfaces across the bottom, these numbers increase, the quality of that stream is severely impacted. So you can get up to 10% of impervious change. After that, you start to see impacts in that stream. That means the water quality diminishes. Your, your bugs and in, in aquatic insects that live in that stream that feed your fish, the base of your food chain, they start to get impacted. Once you get above 25%, you're seeing some severe problems and moving towards the point of no return. Talked a lot about the nutrient sediments and other nasty things in there. A little touch on water quality again. You know, as that water column gets changed by sediment coming in there, you don't have the healthy ecosystem anymore. The light's not getting down to the bottom. Your aquatic plants can't, can't breathe and respirate as well. And then all these other problems that continue to get into the water system. It ultimately, it affects our streams, but it gets down into the bay and ocean systems as well. Now, fresh water is really a key piece of this. Our planet, we sometimes might forget, is but it's 70% water. Our bodies are 70 to 80% water. But of that water on the planet, only about 2.5% of it is fresh water. And so, if we are polluting that fresh water in our streams and in our groundwater, we're really in trouble. And you look at where that, our water use goes, about 10% of that water use, fresh water use, is in our household, and about 40% of that 10% we use for outdoor irrigation, watering our lawns, that, things of that nature. Agriculture is a huge usage of our fresh water, and much of that water is end up, ends up being wasted in runoff or evaporation. And then it, there's some industrial usage as well. And their predictions are by uh, 2025, we're going to have 2.8 billion people on this planet, and we are going to be in severe water scarcity. We already have regions of the world where that is the case. So why a rain barrel? Okay, first of all, rainwater that falls on our land does become a problem, but it's also right now for us, it's free rainwater. So if you're a gardener, or you're doing anything in your landscape, why would you want to turn on the tap and have to pay WSSC to water your plants when you can collect it? More importantly, the water that you're getting from the heavens is actually going to be better water. It's not chlorinated, it's not treated, it's going to be better for your plants. So you save money on the water bills, you help your plants, and you do get this added benefit of reducing the runoff to the streams. So we talked a little bit about rain barrels already, but there are, they come in all shapes and sizes. A lot of different kinds, some that are commercially available, some that are uh, <coughs> made and repurposed, like the ones uh, ICPRB is putting together here. Now, when GHI started getting into the rain barrel promotion ideas, uh, we are HOA uh, of sorts, a housing cooperative, and what was really important for our community was that the barrels had to meet a certain aesthetic need and a performance need. Uh, the community has standards and covenants on how things are supposed to look, and the, the concern was that they didn't want a bunch of mismatched barrels throughout the community of 1,600 homes where every single house had a different looking barrel. So working with that guidance from our architectural review committee, staff worked to try to identify a couple of barrel types that would meet the aesthetic needs of the community, but also the performance needs, and I'll talk about the performance in a, in a minute. So. Uh, when we originally started the program, we selected two different barrel types uh, that were uh, that met the criteria. The one on the left is called the Rain Box. That's a commercial uh, product manufactured here in Maryland, and this, which is about a 60-gallon barrel, you'll see it's a square barrel, very similar in size to these guys. 
and then the riverside barrel on the right hand side a uh, commercially developed barrel actually originally was uh, manufactured by a firm in Toronto uh, they have a very uh, progressive rain harvesting system in Toronto and this particular barrel is 132 gallons so it's a fairly significant barrel as far as the volume it'll, it'll hold. Um, the River Safe Barrel produced by Riversides is the company who makes it. It is actually a, a not-for-profit entity based out of Toronto that promotes uh, rain harvesting practices much like the programs you've heard about today here in Prince George's County. Um, that particular barrel is 132 gallons. Basic footprints here. But I'm going to touch on a couple of design features that are really important for, to consider. The overflow out of, coming out of these barrels. As you all know, Maryland storms aren't these nice, misting Seattle storms where it rains gently for a long period of time. <laughs> Our storms come and bam, they're on us. So I'll talk a little bit about volume in a second, but when you have a, a flashy storm event with a lot of water coming at once, if your barrel's full, that water is going to going to need to go somewhere quickly to get away from the foundation. So we specified a minimum uh, inch and a half of overflow on any barrel that would be installed in GHI. The idea is an inch and a half pipe would be able to have a sufficient capacity to ex uh, evacuate that extra water from the barrel when they fill. These ones have a two or a four inch uh, overflow. Obviously the bigger the better because it won't, won't back up. We also, it's important to figure out how you're going to get the water out of your barrel for use. Uh, both of uh, the barrels that we've looked at, we wanted a, a connection on them that would take a standard three-quarter inch garden hose so you can easily water from the barrel. And then the, uh, a filter that we'll talk about in a second is important not only to keep the debris from your barrel, the leaf, the little whirly gigs from the maple trees and everything else, but also these as a big source of water, they could be a mosquito breeding ground if they're installed incorrectly and can't perform where you need them to be. So we put in a requirement for a filter um, that meets those criteria. Riversides, they had to come in a number of different color options. This is actually a little old, but they, uh, a lot of variety on that. Now, these barrels here, you'll see today, have holes in them at the top. That's for the water to get in. But it also gives you the ability that if this barrel is filled up, that water will freeze, and it freezes, it's going to overflow and not split the barrel. The barrels that we have specified in GHI actually have some free room at the top. So as that barrel freezes, the ice expands, and you're not going to have a, a, the barrel explode. Child safe, this is really important, because if you're going to have 60 to 132 gallons next to your house, you don't want somebody going head over heels into the barrel. So some sort of sealed lid is really key. And a filter is really important to keep those mosquitoes out. Uh, a 500 micron filter is a, is a very fine mesh that is fine enough that mosquitoes are not going to be, be able to lay eggs through your filter into your barrel. The mosquitoes will lay eggs on the surface of any water. They don't need much more than a teaspoon. So you have to be able to have some mechanism to keep those eggs from touching a water surface so they don't breed. In, in some cases, it's also not a bad idea to consider uh, looking, keeping a close eye on your barrel to make sure that you don't have any uh, extra water that is <coughs> outside of the filter where mosquitoes could get into. And, but I'll, and there's some practices you can look at for that as well. But, but for ours, uh, we also look for, is it easy to clean and operate? This is a good example. You could easily scrape your hand off the top of the barrel to get the leaf litter that's inevitably going to be there off. The barrels that we specified also have a, a little filter on top. And then, as I said, size for Maryland rains is really important. And we'll see why in a second here. This is the math of rainflow. We have all this information is on our website as well, so you don't have to worry about writing it down. But basically, a 400 square foot roof, just as, a, as an example, you want to take that area, measure by the number of downspots you have on that roof. Let's say this roof assumes that you're going to have uh, 200 square foot per downspout, for instance. If you get a half inch of rain on that roof, each downspout is going to deliver 57 gallons of water in a half inch of rain. In a one inch rain event, you're going to get 113 gallons off of each of those downspouts on a 400 square foot roof. 
If you think about the size of your home, you go up and, and increase those numbers. More typical home, 800 square foot maybe, thereabouts for a, a rooftop. Figuring four downspouts on an average roof like that, that's going to be about 200 square foot per downspout. That gets you right around that same math. And why that's important is then you, don't, you want to size your barrel such that it can actually keep up with that downspout's flow. A one-inch rain event is not all that atypical here in Maryland. And so if you get a one-inch rain and that, thing, that barrel's filled and you know you've got three more days of rain projected, projected, your barrel is going to be at capacity and you're still going to be getting rain coming into it which is really why this, the overflow, this one's designed with a hose that comes out of here. In general, if your downspout right now is going to the grass in your yard, you're going to want to be able to return that overflow to the grass in your yard on a splash block directed so it gets away from the foundation of your home. If your downspouts right now go into the ground at, at your foundation, you, you, you're going to need to look at how you, the land in your yard flows. If your land is very flat, you really don't want to put that extra rain straight on the land next to your foundation. Why? What happens if you get water near your foundation? Gets into the house, exactly. So you really need to think about, if you're managing stormwater on your property, where does it go beyond your practice? If your rain barrel is your practice, you're going to capture what you want, but where does the extra go? You have to think about, can my landscape sustain it? Should I put it back into the, uh, the downspout if it's overflows? You really, there's not a right answer. You have to look at your property. And this gets to thinking about how you're going to install this barrel. So you want to, you want to site the barrel where you plan to use it, ideally. If you have a lot of downspouts around your house, but only one area that you garden or that you really are landscaping in, that's probably the best place to put a rain barrel for starters because that's where you're going to use the water. Um, a firm foundation that was brought up earlier is very, very important um, because you don't want these barrels to be on an unlevel foundation so when they fill it up they're going to tip over uh, where they're going to be a dead load of up to a thousand pounds or more where the foundation can't support that. You don't want to put these things on a milk crate for instance and then have your barrel fill up with water and then collapses. We, uh, we will also require, and I think there's some debate about this in, in, in the, the rain harvesting universe, but we are pretty, feel pretty strongly that using a hard pipe connection is really important. You know, everyone's seen these sort of flexible accordion pipes that you can get from Home Depot and Lowe's, and people will attach them to your downspout and then just sort of lean them over the rain barrel. It works, but what happens when the wind blows? What if that downspout gets blown by the windy storm and then that water that's coming from your rooftop is not hitting your barrel but splashing all over the house? So we recommend a hard pipe connection. In other words, taking aluminum connection from your downspout, putting aluminum elbows in, and directing it into the inflow of your rain barrel so that way it can really hold up to the weather events. And then where that inlet comes in, that downspout diversion comes in, you don't want it come and tight up against your rain barrel. Any, any ideas why? Well, it will splash off, but what, what, what comes down your gutters and downspouts in the fall? Leaves. leaves. Yeah, lots of leaves, right? You want to be able, when that rain comes in at elbows and turns down in, you leave a gap so you can just easily pull any leaf litter that, that comes out of those downspouts out. Otherwise, it packs up in that downspout above the barrel. And so your rain barrel that's supposed to be harvesting rainwater is now basically just cemented in with leaves and the water is overflowing your gutters and coming down your windowsills. You want to be able to, to allow access for maintenance, which gets to really the, the maintenance question. So you've installed your barrel, you're excited, you're collecting rainwater, you've got 200 gallons in there and you're like, yeah, it's free, I'm, uh, I'm ready to, to put it out in my garden. Well, what do you... How do you know if your barrel's actually working? So after a storm, recommend going in and checking the water levels in your barrel, you know, making sure that it's actually flowing in the way you expected it to. Uh, making sure you don't have a lot of debris and stuff coming in and uh, blocking up those filters. I had a question in back, I think.
Okay, okay. Yep, okay. Yep, okay. Well, I, I'll, I'll save this for the other speakers here. But generally, it is the barrel, I will say, closing on this point, you don't put them in and forget them. I mean, they need you to pay attention to them. As far as GHI goes, GHI does have uh, established rules and requirements for its barrels. Um, I brought a printout of our website here that has the details for uh, ordering and installing a barrel with, as long as well as some uh, frequently asked questions. We have a permit process that GHI does require for its members. This essentially is an application form that re uh, looks at a couple of things. The size of the barrel that you're planning to install, the type of the barrel you're planning to install, the location you're planning to install it. In GHI, most of our, down, our downspouts are shared downspouts between two different townhomes. In that case, we require a neighbor consent to make sure that, that your next door neighbor is, is on board with the idea of you put a rain barrel on that shared property line between the two units. In that case, it really has allowed for some opportunities for neighbor cooperation. I've seen a few situations where people have shared the cost of the rain barrel install because they both share the rainwater that comes from it. We also will look at the footing and the foundation and the return to storm drain connections. These are all required in GHI because GHI is the co-op is responsible for the building structure of, of, the, of our homes. So we want to make sure that the barrels are installed in a way that doesn't cause a, a, a real problem. The, uh, the rain check program that you heard about today is eligible for GHI members. The way I would envision that this program would roll out for GHI members is you would apply to install a rain barrel in GHI first. It is reviewed by GHI staff and once approved, you could take that application to the county and say, look, we're going to install this barrel and can I get the rebate? GHI does offer a bulk purchase program of the rain barrels you saw that we had here uh, through our, for our membership. So we maintain a list of folks who are interested in, in buying these rain barrels and then a couple times a year we'll make a bulk order on volume. But both of these manufacturers are also producing barrels locally in Maryland now, so you can go straight to the manufacturer on them for ordering. The, uh, the general cost of these barrels vary based on the size and the color of them. Um, the, they, the larger barrels, the Riverside barrels that I, I didn't bring one today for a demo, but you saw the photo, uh, are about a $225 barrel. And they're not cheap, but they're also about twice the size and volume as the ones you're looking at here. So if you look at the rain check rebate would also take, I think Carol, is that 50 bucks off the top of a rain barrel? These barrels, there's, there's a couple aspects of maintenance. One is to make sure if they're full and not to overflowing, which that overflow should help, right? But, and checking to make sure you don't have leaf debris so they're not backing up at the foundation. But I would recommend from a, a, a stormwater perspective, if you know you got a lot of days of rain scheduled, don't think about your barrel as much as a, a catchment device. Think about it as a rain slowing device. The biggest problem with stormwater often is the flashiness of the storm. You get a lot of runoff all at once and it goes into the stream and causes erosion. These barrels, any barrel that's installed, is going to fill up, hold that water, and slowly allow it to be released. So in a lot of rain events, take that spigot at the bottom of your barrel, connect, attach it to a hose, and leave it in the open position. Let that barrel slowly drain itself. And then once the rains are, uh, are starting to, to taper off, close it up, fill it up for that next that dry spell for holding on to it. But think of it as a way of slowing down the flashiness of those storm events and, and more emulating a natural cycle of slowly allowing the water to work its way through the, the system. 